So a little bit of an overview just to get us started in case people aren't too familiar with this. Uh, the Broughtons are the area, it's kind of an all-encompassing term for the area north of Desolation Sound, but south of uh, the north end of Vancouver Island over towards the, the mainland side. And it's a bunch of islands and channels and so forth. Uh, the cool thing is it's only, it's less than 100 nautical miles from Gorge Harbor to Pierre's Echo Bay. And there's only 12 miles of that where the weather really has any impact on your trip. So it's, it's generally, uh, if you've been across the Strait of Georgia, it's no worse than that. Uh, it's often a lot easier than that. The tidal rapids can be kind of frightening, but we, can, we know with, with reasonable precision right now uh, when on July 21st or July 22nd or July 23rd or whatever your dates are, uh, that when you can go through those rapids. So there's, we'll walk through those calculations uh, in a little bit. Here's a map that just kind of shows the area. Uh, it's a loosely defined area here. There's also this big area that's kind of between Desolation Sound and the Broughtons. There's lots of good stops in there. There's, uh, we'll walk through the marinas in, in that area. And then there's the North Vancouver Island section right in there. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. That's where Port McNeil and Port Hardy and, and kind of major resupplies are. Remember, you're not crossing an ocean here. You're, uh, you're going to be within cell phone range a lot of the time. We'll talk more about that. There's great marine services up in Port McNeil right here. There's Volvo, Suzuki, Yamaha. Uh, so you can, if you have any problems, they can get dealt with locally. Um, so there, there's a lot of support. The marina in Port McNeil, I have some brochures. These guys are awesome. Uh, North Island Marina, they'll help organize mechanics if you need it, or divers, or whatever, whatever is necessary to keep your, your trip going. So compared to Desolation Sound, have you guys all been to Desolation at this point? Excellent. And the Broughtons tend to be a little bit cooler. Uh, they're a little bit rainier, typically, but not always. They tend to be less crowded. They're, they're not as many kind of two-week vacationers up there. It's just a little further and harder to get to. And so you get people that are out for three, four weeks or all summer rather than, than just a couple of weeks. There are lots of big boats, uh, the tons of couples on 60-footers and 70-footers. And the, the cool thing is your boats are faster and more efficient and you have the same view and you can get into a bunch of places they, they can't necessarily. You don't have to be as concerned about reservations. Um, so there's, there's 50, 60, 70 foot boats are, are totally not needed. You don't need uh, water makers and life rafts and you know, all this, this expensive gear to go cruising the Broughtons. It's very civilized, uh, but it feels remote when you're up there. There are a lot of mom and pop marinas and it's kind of going through a transition right now. So some of the marinas are for sale, Pierre's is for sale, Quatsi Bay is for sale. We'll talk about all these places in a little bit. Keep that in mind, these are small marinas. They're, they're operating for a short season. They're off grid a lot of the time. So the power is expensive if you're plugged in because they're making it with a diesel generator. And Try to, if you're going to be, you know, if you make a reservation for a place and you can't go there for whatever reason, try to let them know as soon as possible so they can, they can open that space up to somebody else. July and August tend to be pretty busy up there. That's the, the peak season. And so it, it, reservations are a good idea if you, if you can. Uh, not necessary at every place, but like for the pig roast and some of the events, it's, it's critical. Supplies uh, are kind of variable. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. I mentioned this at the beginning, don't forget the area between Desolation Sound and the Broughtons. So there's this, this area once you get through the first three rapids, so through Yukulta and Dent and Gillard, you get through those rapids and it opens up into an area with about a half dozen neat marinas and you can spend a few days in there and then go out into John Johnstone Strait for the 12 mile hop into the Broughtons. And you can't forget happy hour in the Broughtons. It is totally a way of life. Uh, you don't have to bring something fancy, but it's pretty typical that every boat, boat brings something. It could be chips and salsa. It could be something more elaborate. It could be fresh salmon. Who knows? Uh, but bring something. Bring your own drink, typically. Bring your own plates and utensils. And, and you gather around on the dock or in a building. This is at Pierre's. And you just have a good time talking boats, talking boating. You might be sick of that by then, so you <laughs> talking other things. But um, it's really fun. You'll meet a ton of people. Everybody's welcoming and friendly, and uh, I think you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised at how social cruising the Broughtons can be. Sam, question. Yeah. Is that, does someone organize that, or is that just organic, like people just start 
Great question. Now, does somebody organize these happy hours? And at some of the marinas, it is organized by the marina. And, and so like Lagoon Cove typically has a bunch of, the marina will provide prawns for everyone and other people bring, bring other things to contribute. Some marinas, it just kind of happens organically on the dock. Um, but at about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, people kind of start gathering typically. And you don't ever have to participate in it. So don't feel, if, if you're not a social person, don't feel like you're obligated to go to all this stuff. But it can be fun and, uh, and, a, and a nice way to get off the boat and meet new people and um, see other, other boats and that kind of thing. So this is a carryover from the Points North seminar, but a lot of this stuff is the same no matter where you're going. And I like to start with the knowns. Say I need water every four days. If you know that in advance, that can kind of be your building block. So you look through the, the itinerary, or you look through the options, and you say, OK, I'm going to anchor here. I'm going to go to that marina that doesn't have water. And then uh, I need to start thinking about water. Uh, the Wagner Cruising Guide is really useful for this. and uh, just generally plan around if you know you need fuel every 80 miles. That's totally doable. Uh, but work, work around your, your knowns. Plan for some days off. You don't want to just plan. Like you could get up to the Broughton, especially in some of the faster boats. You could be up there in, in just a couple of days from here. But that doesn't account for weather or side trips you might want to do or, or kind of the spontaneous fun things that come up when you're cruising. So plan some days off. Ask questions. The Tugnuts is a, a great website. A lot of people have already been to the Broughtons in that group. Ask questions about their favorite locations, their challenges, uh, where they got supplies, that kind of stuff. Yeah? What, what's, your, what's your suggestion for typical days worth of cruising uh, time-wise? Great question. How, many, how long should you plan for this trip? Is that kind of what you're... You're getting at, or per day? Are we talking about five hours, six hours, twelve hours? Or, or yeah. So okay, let's let's actually let's go through. What boats do people have here? We'll start up here. Cutwater. Cutwater. Thirty. 30 okay. We'll have a Ranger thirty-one by that time. Okay. So you're gonna you you guys are both probably cruising the 15, 16 knot range. Is you guys? Okay. Any of the, anybody have new outboard powered ones? Those tend to be a little faster, but the... Ranger 25, and I typically go displacement. Seven knots or so, six knots. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So uh, personally, I like cruising about four or five hours a day. That works out to the sweet spot for me. That's uh, in, in at 15 knots, it's of course twi almost twice as far, or maybe more, t more than twice as far as, as he's cruising in a 25. If you figure out, I mean, what do you like when you're going up to desolation? Does five, six hours a day seem like too much or? Because that you can cover a lot of ground of that in five or six hours. And, and so some, so I, at seven I do more. Yeah. So seven hours is fine. Yeah. And it's pretty relaxing at seven knots. You don't have to, it's quieter and you don't worry about the things you might hit and, <laughs> and all that. I hit a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, it's, it's very much a personal thing. I, I find f most people tend to be pretty happy with that four to five hours a day that you're not having to wake up at the crack of dawn and, and bust out of there and, and yet you, you still have enough time when you get in somewhere that you can enjoy it and see it. I plan for some lay days too and there are going to be some days between Desolation and the Broughtons that are, are real short. I mean we're talking eight miles, ten miles just because you're, you're in this zone where uh, there's not, there's several good stops, but they're not that far apart. No. Is the weather typically better in the morning and you know, deteriorating as the day goes on, or does it stay pretty constant? Yeah, the weather tends to be calmer in the morning, but well, it, other than the 12 miles in Johnstone Strait, the wind just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in really protected channels, and unless it's, even when you hear 25 thir to 35 knot winds, on Johnstone, it just doesn't get too bumpy on the, the protected inner channel. So the weather, other than that one day in Johnstone, and then ag again when you're going across to Port McNeil, across Queen Charlotte Strait, there's just not much of a weather concern on these days. I like doing a spreadsheet, especially for a new, new place, like if you're going to the Broughtons for the first time. Uh, figure out where you want to start the day, where you want to end the day, plot it out. Do you guys all have Navionics on your smartphones or tablets? 
super useful app and it does auto routing so it gives you a good idea of how far things are without having to plot the whole route individually. So I do use that a lot when I'm planning. I says, okay, I think I want to go to from say Gorge Harbor to Big Bay, Stewart Island. Uh, is that realistic in a day? And, and it's really quick to see that on Navionics. Put that into the spreadsheet and you can start figuring out where you can get fuel and, and water and whatever other things you need. You can figure out how, how long the days really are and, and um, kind of you can go crazy with the spreadsheet if you want. The charts and guidebooks, first of all, don't worry about having paper charts. Some people interpret the Canadian uh, Coast Guard rules as saying that you have to have complete paper charts for the whole area you're cruising. I've talked to a number of Canadian Coast Guard people who assure me that's the, not the case, that a combination of electronic charts and guidebooks is sufficient to fulfill the requirement. Uh, you definitely want to make sure you have the charts all installed in your chart plotter before you go. So zoom around, zoom in on some places in the Broughtons and make sure there's good detail there. Make sure if you're using Navionics or another app on your phone that you've downloaded the charts so you're not relying on a cell phone connection or an internet connection. And then uh, the only two guidebooks that I, or books that you really should have for this trip, and they'll, if you have just these two, you'll be fine. You can always buy more. But ports and passes, and this is critical for timing the rapids. It's kind of hard to use, but we'll, we'll walk through that in a bit. And the Wagner Cruising Guide, updated every year, and it is kind of the most up-to-date information on the, the facilities in the Broughtons. It's not as complete for anchorages as some of the other books, but it, it gives you enough that, especially on a first trip, there's more than you will ever see on you know, a, a two or three week trip into the Broughtons. Active Captain can be really helpful, uh, especially if you know, if you get to start to know the, uh, the, the reviewers and, and can figure out what they value and if it's the same things that you value or if it's uh, something else. You know, some people might really only care about if they can get free ice or something, and other people might care about the bathrooms. And so not, not all of them are created equal. The Dream Speaker books, uh, they have a Broughton's book. The Douglas Exploring series, they have a Southern BC book that has quite a few anchorages. All these books are available up at Captain's Supply upstairs as you go out towards the parking garage. Uh, and I think there's also, if on, there are, most of them are available through Fine Edge. And are they still giving you guys some kind of a, yep. a discount code? Yeah, I'll have to look that up. But we do get like 20% off anything in that Wagner right store. Perfect. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's like the store slash tug nuts or something like that. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get a link out to you. Yeah. A little bit of spare parts. Some people go overboard with this. Uh, you don't need to be able to fix everything. But there are a few, few things that you should keep in mind. Preventative maintenance should be all up to, uh, up to snuff by the book. Make sure you start out with fresh oil and, and good clean filters and all that kind of stuff. I think everybody should carry it, uh, at least one set or a couple sets of fuel filters, both the primary and the secondary. So they're going to be a filters on the engine and then another filter elsewhere. Make sure you have all those. That's, we, we haven't actually had many issues of dirty fuel, but it, it can happen and uh, you don't want to be the left with without enough filters. Engine oil and coolant, uh, again, this trip's not going to be so long, probably, that you're going to need to do an oil change. But I like having some extra engine oil in case I, I need to change the oil for whatever reason, or I have a, uh, some kind of an oil leak, or who knows what could happen. Same with coolant. Sometimes, a, occasionally, a hose will fall, will, you know, um, kind of become loose, and you'll lose some coolant or, or something like that. And so have a little bit of spare coolant on board. Uh, serpentine belt, an impeller or two for the main engine. Uh, we do see impellers when, when the if seaweed or something gets sucked into the strainer. Engine runs dry for a few minutes and that can toast an impeller. So good to have that. Even if you don't know how to fix all this stuff, if you have the part on board, you can normally find somebody else who will, will be able to help. Carry fuses for everything. Patch kit for your dinghy is really important, especially if you're a dog owner and you're going to shore a lot. Uh, some of these rocks are pretty sharp and you get uh, barnacles and whatnot growing on them. So having some way to patch the dinghy if you put a, a hole in it is super helpful. If you want to go more extensive, uh, we've, we don't see this often, but fresh water pumps occasionally fail. They're not that expensive. And it's really nice if you have a spare on board, especially the same one that came out, so you don't have to do any plumbing changes or anything like that. 
and it's it's a bummer to have your you know full water tank and no way to get the water out of the tank so uh, a, a spare water pump can be good a head rebuild kit nobody wants to deal with the head while they're traveling but occasionally things happen and and you need to so uh, that could be something to think about for the dinghy if you're going to be especially going to shore a lot and you have an outboard consider having a spare dinghy prop they're inexpensive and can get dinged up pretty easily on the rocks uh, spare pull cord we see those break occasionally uh, you can always jury rig something but a lot of the kits if you buy an outboard will already have these this basic stuff in it most of you are probably cooking with propane and propane's available pretty much uh, all over the coast. There's, you're not gonna have any trouble getting the, the propane tanks filled, but I like carrying a little adapter. You can buy them at a hardware store for about half the price of West Marine. You can buy them on Amazon. And to be able to plug those one pound bottles like you'd use in a barbecue or a, a camp stove into your boat system. So that way, if for whatever reason you run out of propane on the, the main tanks on the boat, you have some way to, to cook until you can get those tanks filled up again. Do this, this is uh, from, from the Desolation Sound Talk, but the Broughtons are just the same. They're not that remote. The, the, owner, uh, the uh, owner operators like Pierre, he's over in Port McNeil all the time, you know, several times a week. It's just a few hours from, from Pierre's over to Port McNeil where you can get all sorts of things fixed or, or replaced or whatever. If you do need stuff, uh, parts or supplies. Try to find how, how to get it in Canada. It's hard to get stuff across the border and so the, the marinas can help you with that somewhat. Uh, I'll go through in just a moment there the names of the Volvo, Suzuki, Yamaha dealers along the coast and uh, there's lots of service available. So Port Mc I mentioned this several times now, Port McNeil and Port Hardy are kind of the civilization in the area. They're small towns by normal standards for city dwellers, but pretty bustling for the north end of Vancouver Island. We're talking populations of a few thousand, but supermarkets and doctors and hospitals, and, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit. We really, really prefer Port McNeil to Port Hardy. The marina is great at Port McNeil. Everything's more accessible. Uh, it's, it's an easy spot to go. Tim, the, uh, the quality of gasoline for brow Ford motors and such, has that ever been an issue? Yeah, uh, it has not. No, we've and I don't think most of the Canadian fuel has ethanol in it. Uh, the, the gasoline is dyed typically at a fuel dock in Canada, so it's a funny color, but that's uh, just like our diesel is dyed here, their gas is dyed at many of the fuel docks, but we've never had issues with Canadian gas. If you have a gas-powered outboard, make sure you run it before you leave for the trip. Those, especially the small ones, the carburetors tend to gum up over the winter and it's, it's a lot easier to deal with that when you're home before you've left than once you're, you're underway and you launch the dinghy for the first time. And you sit there trying to start it for 20 minutes until your arm feels like it's gonna fall off. So get that outboard tested and run before you leave. Uh, that's true of pretty much everything on the boat, especially if you haven't been using it much over the winter and, and it's been sitting. Try to use all the systems uh, a week or two before you're leaving on the big trip so that you can have time to fix things if they're not working. So phones uh, work pretty well up through about uh, Johnstone Strait area. Once you get into the Broughtons themselves, they don't work so well. But most of the marinas have some Wi-Fi available. It's typically satellite-based, very slow. Don't expect to be streaming videos or, or anything like that. But you can get email and download weather forecasts and, and so forth. Pl uh, please be a good, a good visitor and, and uh, respect their limits on bandwidth. If one person uses, uses all of it in a day, everyone gets throttled to, to glacial speed. Try to turn off automatic updates on devices and picture backups uh, if you're using like iCloud or something like that. The cell service is pretty good up through Johnstone Strait, like I said, uh, once you, and, and the north end of Vancouver Island. In the Broughtons themselves, not so good, but it's not uncommon to have cell phone service at some point throughout the day. We like Wilson slash WeBoost, it's the same company, just a couple of different names. We like their cell phone boosters. They, can, they won't work where there's no service at all, but they can turn one bar into four bars or um, a weak signal into a usable signal. So if you need to be connected, that's a, a good option. A lot of people nowadays are carrying uh, satellite communicators like an inReach or a Spot 
those are helpful for family or friends who want to follow along or you want to share a float plan but you don't know exactly where you're going. The inReach allows two-way communication so you can text from anywhere. Um, any of you guys have inReaches or spot devices? Okay. Any questions about that stuff? It works. It's great, yeah. Um, yeah, do I have a recommendation between Spot and Reach? I think the InReach is better. Spot just recently came out with one that does a two-way communication, and I've, I've heard pretty mixed reviews. InReach is uh, on the Iridium network, which is a truly global platform. The Spot is on the Global Star network, and that has some pretty big holes in it. Not in our part of the world, but uh, elsewhere. And, and I found that, that the Spot tended to drop out more and, and be a little flakier. You can, and the, the inReach is great. Uh, I think now Spot, you can do it too, but you can activate service just for a month or two in the summer and then not deactivate it and not pay for it all, all winter long. I, I don't think that kind of device is necessary for this, this type of trip unless you really want to be uh, connected somehow the whole time. But it's, if just with a cell phone and Wi-Fi, you can be pretty well connected at least every few days. If you want to have guests come up, there are a couple different options. Uh, the cheapest is probably to have them drive up to Port Hardy or Port McNeil, but that's a long drive. Vancouver Island's, what, 300 miles long or something, and the roads are sometimes questionable, apparently. Kenmore Air and Northwest Seaplanes fly up to a bunch of these marinas. It's very convenient. It's quick. It's expensive, though. So uh, if you, but it's, it's the most convenient way to have guests. There's an airport in Port Hardy that wheel planes come into, and you can fly out, a, out from there or, or to there from Vancouver. And if you're staying at Port McNeil, there's a free shuttle that can pick you up from the, the marina there. And remember, if you have guests on board, they don't necessarily have to stay on the boat with you. You could have guests come in, and you could take them on day trips around and, and return to, like, Pierre's has some accommodations on shore. Some of the other marinas have accommodations on shore, uh, and the guests can stay on shore, you can stay on the boat, and you can take day trips between these different facilities or, or just go out fishing or sightseeing or, or whatever it might be. A lot of people will leave a boat uh, in one of these places and let Pierre or at Sullivan Bay, somebody, or, or Port McNeil, they'll leave the boat for a few weeks or even a few months and then fly, it, fly home do work, do family stuff, whatever they need to do, come back uh, and get on the boat and then come home or continue cruising. And so it's a really nice way for people who are still working who can't get a long period of time off or for people that have weddings or, or you know, children's birthdays or whatever kind of things you have to deal with, you can get home uh, quickly and, and pretty easily, leave the boat, leave it in good hands and, uh, and then come back later on, continue the cruise. You guys have trailerable boats. Uh, I don't know if any of you are, have any intention of trailering up there. It's kind of expensive to take the trailer and truck on the BC ferries, but it's an option. And you avoid any issues with weather on Johnstone Strait, any issues of weather on the Strait of Georgia. And so this is something to think about. I've heard I haven't done any trailering on Vancouver Island myself, but I've been told it can be a little stressful. The, the roads aren't, aren't big interstates necessarily. and um, the traffic is maybe worse than, than some people have said. Any of you guys have experience trailering on Vancouver Island? It's no. Short distances. Yeah. Uh, the roads are much narrower north of Campbell River. Yeah. Up to Campbell River, I think it's a pretty good road, and then north of there, it's. Uh, but but think about that. You can launch in Port McNeil or Port Hardy, and and then go cruising from there, and not worry so much about the weather or the the schedule. Anyone have an idea what it costs to take the boat across? I did one way from uh, Swartz Bay to Sawasan, that big ferry to uh, Vancouver was about $200. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the range of 25 Yeah, it's, and remember these are Canadian dollars too, at least. So, uh, what, it's about 75 cents on the dollar right now, 80 cents on the dollar. So, if you get the BC ferry card, it's 30% off that. Oh, that's not bad then. So w another option to think about, especially if the, the schedule's tight or you're worried about getting beaten up or, or something like that with the weather. 
So the supermarkets, if you're really looking for a, a full service supermarket, you've got Campbell River, of course, down by Desolation Sound. And then you've got Port McNeil and Port Hardy at the north end of Vancouver Island. These have IGAs or, or Foodland or something like that. Big supermarket, you'll get everything you need, good produce. A lot of the marinas will have a small store, and in the season, you know, peak season like July and August, they'll be uh, as well stocked as they'll ever be, but that varies quite a bit. Some places it's chips and, and soda, other places have more extensive uh, supplies. Generally, the produce selections are pretty limited and it can be kind of tough to find, so uh, I would plan on having uh, as much as you can with you on your way up. Don't make the mistake I tend to do, which is, I see all this fresh produce, I'm like, oh, I want to, oh, I don't want to eat it all right away, I want to save some for later on, I save it and save it and save it and then end up tossing it because it grows mold before I can I eat it. So uh, eat it as, eat it as you, you, you know, quickly as you need to, don't, try not to waste it. Um, not all the marinas have stores and uh, not all of the stores have liquor outlets. This is, gets people in trouble sometimes. That We've, we see that people tend to drink a little more on the boats than they expect, uh, especially with all the happy hours. And so some of the marinas, and it's called out in the Wagner Guide, uh, and you can check on marina websites and so forth. Uh, but there are a few places in the Broughtons you can get alcohol. But I don't believe Pierre's is one of them. So it's all BYOB at Pierre's. We can, I think he might stop in here later and we can check for sure. But Sullivan Bay has a liquor outlet, and then of course over at, at Port McNeil. Sam, do you, do you stock up on this once you're across the border, or do you do it here in the U.S. First? Great question. Do you stock up on all this before you cross the border, or once you're uh, once you're in Canada? I try to avoid taking fresh food or alcohol across the border. It's just easier to to not have to declare stuff. Um, the, we found that Canadian Customs is quite generous with their uh, what you can take across in terms of alcohol, they're pretty strict on food. So what they don't like is catching you lying. So if you're, you know, you're going across the border and you say, I, you know, I don't, I'm not over my limit on, on alcohol, they come on your boat and they find more than, than you've declared, they're going to make your day really pretty miserable. If you declare it as excess, they'll probably say, no worries, come on in, you're good. The worst thing they can do is assess a duty on it or take it away if you declare it. If you don't declare it and you get caught, uh, it's a lot worse. So if in doubt, declare it. And the fresh produce, that they, it changes so much that it's a lot easier, we find, just to stop in uh, someplace like Ganges or Nanaimo or uh, Pender Harbor, do the big marketing there for the fresh stuff and just not worry about what the requirements are across the border. By the time you get up to the Broughtons, you'll probably be, you'll have been out for a week or more, I'm guessing, and, and it'll be, you'll start looking at resupplying anyway, and uh, heading, at some point you'll end up over in Port McNeil or, or Port Hardy, probably. So fuel and water are generally really available. Uh, the route that you'll take, most of you will probably take, we'll walk through it here in a bit, takes you by Blind Channel and Lagoon Cove and ends up at Echo Bay. Each of those locations has a fuel dock. Blind Channel has good potable water. Uh, Echo Bay does not have good potable water. It's kind of cedar tan and brown and Pierre drinks it and the locals all drink it but I don't like filling the water tank with it if I drink the water out of my water tank. If you guys don't then you know it's perfectly good for showers and washing dishes and that kind of stuff but I'd be cautious about drinking it. You don't want to get sick while you're out there and uh, you might consider carrying some spare water um, for, for uh, drinking water. Frustratingly, the Wagner Guide doesn't typically distinguish between water and potable water. And so a lot of places will say it has, the dock has water, but that just means it has a hose with something coming out of it. It doesn't, uh, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's water you'd want to fill your tank with. The, Cedar tannin water is, is kind of funny because uh, I'll, I was at Pierre's one year and I, was, I went up and I took a shower there and i looking down, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know I was this dirty. What's going on? This is just brown coming off me. And I, didn't, I, I talked to Pierre afterwards and he said, oh yeah, this is the way the water looks, not you. <laughs> but it looks really weird. Yeah. So then it'll leave some sort of a, I don't want to say a stump, but something inside your tank and you're running yeah, it doesn't. Uh, I 
we have, we've had people fill up that don't drink the water. They fill up with it, and it doesn't seem to have any lasting impact. But if, you're, if you can avoid it, I would. Um, I, I, I don't like filling up with sketchy water. It's a pain to sanitize tanks. You might consider carrying a, a gallon of bleach with you, and I can't remember off the top of my head the formula for sterilizing water tanks. But there's a, it's a pretty easy process of filling the water tank with a certain ratio of bleach. And if you if you need to at some point, you can can always. We know that we have a whole whole boat water filter. Yeah. So do you know will that gum it up the filter uh, quicker than? It shouldn't. No, the water is the water is it runs cleanly. It's not like there's anything you can feel in it. Okay. It's just a, a color thing. Okay. So and the water is the BC government's pretty strict about what what they can say about whether it's potable or not. If it's potable, it has to go through a whole treatment process and be certified. And, and so most of these marinas aren't going to go through that, but they'll say it's fine to drink. And I prefer not to. Yeah. yeah I, I have a filter here on the hose, you know, the yeah. dark filter. Does that filter out the color? Or I don't think anything is going to filter out the color. And, but the color alone isn't, isn't, prob isn't hazardous or anything like that. It's just kind of unsightly. and. Yeah makes you worry about the, <laughs> the general quality. I would look at the details of whatever filter you're using to see if it filters out microorganisms that can cause illness, things like Giardia. And a lot of this is stream water that they're, they're pulling out from somewhere. And who knows what's upstream. Yeah, laundry, showers. I'm going to go through the whole list of marinas, all these places, and I think I call out most of that. The Wagner Guide is also a great resource for the specific amenities at a given facility. But yes, most of them have a shower. Most of them have a, some kind of laundry facility. And this is all honor system. It's not like you go to a laundromat down here and you feed quarters into it or the showers where you feed quarters. You, you just tack this onto your bill and you know, it's five bucks a day for a shower or whatever. And, 10 bucks for a load of laundry and it's a first come first serve and honor system. It's a, a very, very dignified way to do things. The laundry will also have the uh, cedar tannin in there. Yeah, though if you're at a place that has cedar tannin water like Pierre's then you're going to get the laundry water will have that too. I've never found any lasting impact on clothes but, but maybe I'm not a, my, my whites aren't that white to begin with so. <laughs> Speaking of facilities, what about, I've heard garbage disposal is a big problem. Yeah, yeah, great, great topic of conversation, actually. Garbage disposal is a problem. Typically, I recommend getting rid of as much packaging as you can beforehand. So strip out that cardboard and put stuff in Ziploc bags if you can. Um, get rid of as, just as much on the way in. A lot of stuff is packaged really inefficiently. And so get as much, rid of as much as you can on the way in. Keep things separate. They'll, often they'll take cans, for instance, at a marina, or glass, but they won't take plastic. And burnables, like cardboard, paper, that stuff can, some marinas have burn barrels. They're getting rid of those at some places. Somebody at, I can't remember, maybe it was Pierre telling me, somebody was saying that they went and they, they did the burn barrel thing and somebody had put one of those little one pound propane bottles in there and it went boom. And that they ended the burn barrel after that. So please, please use common sense. Don't put aerosols in there. <laughs> yeah. And when you were mentioning uh, to get rid of a lot of the packaging, doesn't customs want things packaged? Yeah. So a good question. Customs does want things packaged if they have meat uh, or produce. But if it's you know packaged pasta, or rice, or or dry beans or dry goods, that stuff they don't care about. So garbage, the generally garbage, you're going to have a, have a hard time dealing with it any place in the Broughtons. Save it for a, a trip over to Port McNeil or Port Hardy and get rid of it there. Keep, and, and uh, you know, it's, in our experience, people tend to spend a week or two in the Broughtons and then, then go over to town kind of and resupply. We're not talking great distances here, 20, 30 miles. And so it's not hard to buzz over there get fresh produce, dump the garbage, fill up the water tank, and then come back out into the Broughtons. Do these marinas have pump out stations or is it? No, you're pumping out into the, 
And so that's worth talking about too. There, there are very few pump out stations because frankly, there's nowhere to, there's, even if you pumped out, where does it, where does it go? So you'll, there's pump outs over on the north end of Vancouver Island, but in the Broughtons themselves, there are no pump outs. Please uh, make sure your macerators are working before, before you leave. Uh, I don't run your macerator dry. We had that issue last summer. So you wanna make sure that it, it's, when, it's, when it's working, it's, uh, it's pumping overboard and then shut it off as soon as it's empty. Em pump out when you're underway, preferably on an ebb, ebb current, ebb tide, and when the, you're underway far, as far as you can from shore, as far as you can from anchorages. Nobody wants to be around a boat that's pumping out in an anchorage or at a marina or something like that. If, you, if it's the, you're suddenly unexpectedly full and you're at a marina, um, tell the, the marina operator that, hey, I need to save my spot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out into the channel and, and take care of something and be right back. <laughs> so Volvo service, you can get Campbell River and Progressive Diesel. Uh, well, Progressive Diesel in Port McNeil, Advanced Marine Power in Campbell River. I don't have the phone numbers, but it's easy to Google if you, if you need it. I highly doubt that you'll need it. These engines are, are really robust nowadays, and if they're well taken care of, you, you shouldn't have any trouble. Yamaha, uh, if you have an outboard, you can, easy to do in Campbell River and Port Hardy. Port Hardy and Port McNeil are uh, maybe a half hour drive apart, so their mechanics can travel between the two easily enough. Uh, Suzuki, if any of you guys have Suzuki's, oh, what is this? Suzuki, similar service, the same dealer in Campbell River as Yamaha uh, and Stryker up in, in Port Hardy. Stryker is also a pretty good electronics outfit and electrical outfit if you have any, any gremlins with that kind of stuff. Th I can't emphasize enough how helpful the marina in Port McNeil is about getting mechanics or, or techs or whatever uh, available to work on your boat. So if you're having problems, don't hide this. Don't be embarrassed. Don't worry <laughs> about it excessively. Uh, just, just try to get in touch with people who can help. And, uh, and certainly at, at Port McNeil, they can sort out any issues you might have. The one exception to this is haul-outs. There are not many haul-outs on this section of coast. We'll talk about the only one, really, that's available, and that's in um, the Tarkinen Marine Ways. It's a, in Swaintula. It's just a basic marine railway. It's not a travel or anything like that. So best if you can avoid uh, rock strikes, log strikes, that kind of stuff. So we'll talk now about the two gates kind of to get up into the Broughtons and that's the rapids in here. We've got three rapids in close succession right there. The rapids are great. They're predictable. They're calm four times a day. We know a year in advance when they're going to be calm and, and easily transitable. Johnstone Strait is a little bit more difficult. It's this body of water is narrow uh, but runs about 50 miles. You only have to be out there for 12 and uh, it's a little harder to predict. Summers, especially in the afternoons, you tend to get a northwesterly that builds up and can be pretty nasty. You get quite a bit of current through there, so there can be four knots of current out in Johnstone Strait. And if you get that again, say, a, uh, so if you get a four knot ebb going kind of north, so that the current's going this way, the wind is coming down that way, and it can stack up and be really nasty. But those conditions are, are not uncommon, but they're also not super common and in a few day period typically you can get a nice calm section to, to blast up through through the 12 miles or so in Johnstone and then into the Broughtons and then you're kind of home free again. There are there are a few different options for the route up here. The I call it the highway route goes up this way. Uh, it's just all in Johnstone Strait and if the wa water's calm and the wind's cooperating that can be a, a nice option but I wouldn't recommend it for your first visit. I'd go the back way. Uh, this is through, through all the rapids like I described uh, and then out into Johnstone Strait. It's more protected, it's more scenic, it's more interesting and, and it's fun to go through these rapids and understand how they work. And the cool part is when you go through, you won't even realize it's a rapid because it, it'll just be flat calm and uh, maybe just a, f a few swirlies, but nothing major. Yeah. Now, I've heard that the rapids going, if you're going northbound, the timing is off. Uh, yeah. We're coming south on the one to the other to the other. Um, can you explain that a little bit? 
Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that in a few minutes. But the the, the challenge is the current uh, turns in the wrong order. So the first rapid you get to is the the last one to turn, and then you're you're kind of your timing. If you hit the first one right, you're increasingly off in the timing for the rest of them. So you have to cheat them a little bit. But we'll we'll talk about that in detail here and do some exercises and break out our calculators and, and all that fun stuff. There are also a bunch of options through here uh, that you can kind of variations on this. You can pop out into Johnstone Strait here or here or here. So there's there are tons of different ways you can really do this. And there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever is good for the situation. But we're going to focus on this back way. This is probably the most common and I think the most interesting uh, and keeps you in protected water the longest. A bunch of marinas to stop it along the way, uh, and we'll go through all that in a bit. So before we get there, a little bit about the highway route. The big obstacle here is just north of Campbell River. You might have heard of Seymour Narrows, and the currents there run to 18 knots. These are serious currents. Even the, the, all the shipping traffic, cruise ships, barges, they're all going through it slack because it's quite hazardous when it's running 18 knots. Uh, and then you've got, you've got a whole bunch of time in Johnstone Strait. I already mentioned this a bit. I w unless the weather's perfect, don't go this way. This is the, the route that we prefer. Yukulta Rapid, Gillard Passage, Dent Rapids. These are all within just a few miles. And it's, uh, it's not nearly as difficult as, as, it, as some of the books make it sound or other cruisers make it sound. The challenge here is you arrive at Yukulta first. That's the southernmost of the rapids. This is what you were just alluding to. You arrive there first, but it's the last one to turn. Uh, Gillard Passage next, just a mile and a half further on. And then Dent Rapids is the last one on a northbound trip. It's probably the most hazardous. And you're going to arrive there last, but it will have already turned first. And so uh, the timing can be a bit of a challenge. You cheat them a little bit. But our general rule of thumb is plan to arrive at Dent Rapids at Slack, and everything else will fall into place. Uh, you'll cheat the others a little bit. It'll maybe be a little squirrely as you have three or four knots of current. But even we've been through there with full displacement sailboats and, and you know, Katie Krogans and Nordhavens and boats that don't have any speed. And they make it through just fine. It's just uh, maybe not the place to have the autopilot steering. And Is there any, a good part of Slack that we should hit Dent at the beginning or end? Or? Slack at Dent is just a few minutes. And so you just, I would say within plus or minus 15 minutes is typically fine. And depending on the time, so on a, on a small tidal exchange, you have a much bigger window of time that's acceptable. If you've got a huge tides, then you're going to see stronger current velocities and a narrower window to, to go through that than if you have. And I think that it looks like if you guys are going up around the 21st of July, 22nd of July, that kind of time frame, it look, currents look pretty mild. Um, these rapids go to mid-teens, and I think they were about the velocities were about half that in that, in that yeah, July time. They were pretty mild, mm -hmm. um, but had gone past that engine. Yeah, and you're going you're to see a little movement in the water probably, and that's OK. It's not a, not a big deal. If you want to get a little warm up for this, go and play in Deception Pass. Uh, go through Deception Pass, kind of increasingly strong velocities, and, and go through when it's running four knots. It's, it's perfectly safe as long as there's not a big uh, south wind that's going to stack up against the ebb on the outside and see how the boat responds in the little whirlpools and, and boils and so forth. But the, the boats tend to do pretty well. I'll show you a video in, in a few minutes of Dent Rapids when it's really running and you'll, you'll see why you don't want to be there then. But that's when it's running 16 knots or something like that. What, what's the boat traffic like for these? Yeah, yeah, the boat traffic, especially in July and August, can be a little bit heavy. Uh, if you're there alone, you've probably done something wrong. <laughs> you, probably, you probably should recheck your math. If, if you look in the binoculars and you're seeing white water, then probably you should double check your math. Uh, you, don't have to, you can always wait. That's one of the great things about being on the boat. You're not flying an airplane. You're not driving a car down the interstate. You can put the thing in neutral and double check. You can call other boats on the radio and check with them. The, 
biggest thing to be alert about are tugs and tows coming through. So that you get the barges with the tugs with the, the barges or log tows, and you just don't want to necessarily be in the choke points uh, at the same time that, that they're there. Is it just a security that you issue before you go into them? Or? Yeah, and most recreational boats don't issue a security. The, the big stuff that they'll issue security, they're not always on AIS, which is a little unnerving. But listen to channel 13 and 16 if you can uh, on your way into the area. Your boats are, are small enough and maneuverable enough and quick enough that it's pretty easy to, to dodge out of their way. And uh, The local guides run like 24-foot Grady Whites through here at all times, and they don't care about any of the, any of the c other traffic. And so it's, it's not, a, these aren't so narrow. It's not like Dodd Narrows where, where you really don't want to be there probably with you know, a tug and barge going the other way. You, there's, no, there's enough room you can skirt around them. There are two more rapids, so you get through these three, and those are the biggies. But then there's two more. There's Green Point and there's Whirlpool. Those rapids are not nearly as big a deal. You can go through almost any time you want. Uh, better to go towards slack, but, but at the timing, we'll talk about that later on. The timing there, again, is difficult. You know, northbound trip, it's all wrong. You're an hour early at the first one, an hour late at the next one, and, and that's OK. There are good spots to overnight through here. So if you get through through Yukulta and you say, oh, that was, that was not right. We, this was, this was too, too much current or we're worried about Gillard and Dent. You can always pull in. There's a marina right there. You can pull in and wait for the next tidal exchange or wait half an hour until it's slack. So we'll, we'll go through that all here in a moment. And then you get up into the Johnstone Strait. There's the 12 miles. You can duck out into Port Neville if the weather is deteriorating. There's good anchorages right before you, you pop out into after all the rapids, but before Johnstone Strait. So you can do this in really manageable chunks, uh, and, and you don't have to rush through it all in, in one fell swoop. So here is Dent Rapids, and, and this is, whoops, let's see if I can make this play. This is a cool video. So Dent Island Lodge has a jet boat tour you can take, and they'll run through all the rapids at maximum velocity and, and show you, that's Devil's Hole. Uh, you can see why it's named that, probably. It's a nasty whirlpool. You don't want to be there at that time. But in six hours or three hours or whatever, um, it's, it's nice and calm. You'll get through without any drama. Uh, and you can go back on this boat and watch the whole thing unfold. Dent, Ra Dent Island Lodge is a beautiful spot, but it is uh, a little costly as a destination. We'll talk about that, too, in a few minutes. So anybody, you guys are all familiar with this Ports and Passes book? I highly, highly recommend this over the Canadian Hydrographic Service tables. The CHS tables are, uh, I think you need, you need volume six for this section. They are not adjusted for daylight savings time. And an hour off makes a big difference in these places. So use this book. It's adjusted for daylight savings time. It's got all the, the, uh, the ports that you need for the whole coast. It's no more expensive than getting all the CHS books, and we use it all the time. Be cautious of looking at your electronics. The Garmin or, or Raymarine, whoever's electronics you have, will typically tell you. They'll have arrows, and it'll tell you when, when slack is and how strong the currents are going to go. We found them mostly right, but occasionally wrong. And so it's a good second source, but this is going to be the, the one that you're going to really rely upon. And we'll, ha we'll go through, I think, a, a exercise of calculating the, the exact times of slack and when you'll want to leave and all that kind of stuff for the 21st of uh, July, when, when some of you might be heading north or right around that time. Kevin Monahan is a, an author and, and cruiser up here. Well, he, he was really a Coast Guard officer and a fisherman, I guess. But he's done a lot of boating in this area. He's got a book called Local Knowledge. And that has a ton of information about this area specifically and how to use back eddies in, in Johnstone Strait and where the worst turbulence is. So it's not a very expensive book. It's maybe $20. And it's, it can be quite helpful for demystifying the, the rapids and Johnstone Strait. We recommend arriving a little bit early. So you can get to Yucatan maybe a half an hour before you think you want to go through and scope it out with the binoculars. Talk to other boats around if, if you're traveling together. 
uh, and then kind of look for white water. Again, you don't want to see that white water. You want to see some other boats around, probably. Don't automatically trust that somebody else knows better than you. That's a, a common problem. People say, oh, that guy went through, so he must know something that I don't. And there's just as, as high a chance that he doesn't have a clue what he's doing. Uh, so, so always check your work, especially for couples that are doing this together. I encourage you both to, to independently do the calculations. Uh, get comfortable with it. If you're coming up with a different conclusion, figure out why. Talk amongst yourselves. Talk to other boaters on the docks beforehand. Uh, and don't worry too much. If you get it wrong, you can wait. And it's just going to be a few more hours until you can go through. And so I like having going early enough in the day that if I, if I need to push it back to the next tide cycle, I still have enough daylight. These July days are very long. And so you have a lot of opportunity to get through the rapids without, without any drama. So the, the way we do this, these calculations, we've got primary and secondaries in here. And so the primaries, you open up, uh, and Gillard Pass is a primary. And so you find this is all organized alphabetically. The blue, blue here means it's a tide station. So tide, we're talking about height of the water. Current stations are red, and that's velocity of the water. And so we're going to look at. Gillard Pass, and yeah, yeah. Go, go grab some of them if, if that's easy, and because we'll have time here to, to really dive into this. This book confuses more people than anything else I've seen cruising in this, this part of the world. Uh, and once people get it, it's kind of like ah, oh, that makes sense. But uh, if you're struggling with this, don't, don't worry about it. It's it's something that can be learned. So Gillard Pass is the rapid in the middle. And then Yokota is the first one. Dent is the last one of the three. But the only one in the book is Gillard Pass. And so then you've got to calculate the secondary stations. Those are Dent and uh, Yokota. And it's simple math, There's, but it's, it, it, it's easy to screw it up. So there are a couple of steps here. One, you have to determine if this is a turn to flood or a turn to ebb. I think I have, we have a worksheet too that, that we'll do here in a minute. So see here, this, this first column, whoops, first column here, it, that's the times of slack for a given day. So we've got 447 in the morning. That slack's not going to work, obviously, because it's still dark or close to it. Plus, you have had to get to the rapids in the first place. 1101 is a good one. Uh, 558 starting to get late in the day. But I, I would target this 1101. And then we go over in the column, and we see a plus. And that means that, that at 226, there is going to be a flood, a 10.7 knot flood. Uh, the plus means flood. A minus means ebb. And so if you're in this, this column, 1101 slack, you go over here, OK, it's a turn to flood because th th you see that plus there. Uh, and so that is going to make a difference of about 10 or 15 minutes on the calculations when you're adjusting for the secondary ports. And we'll, we'll walk through this all in detail here in a minute. Can you say it again? I think I missed it. Plus is flood? Plus is flood, minus is ebb. And what, what's the 1101? That's Slack. That's slack, and this is maximum. So that's so at 11:01 it's going to be slack. At 2:26 p.m. it's going to be a 10.6 knot flood, and then at 5:58 it's going to be slack again, and at 9 p.m. it's going to be a seven knot ebb. And so it, it, when you think about it logically, it starts to make some sense that okay, if if it's slack now and then it's going to be flooding, so it's it's a turn to flood. Uh, TTF for short. And you can look on this chart in here, and we'll, we'll all get time in a moment to look at this in detail and work out some of the math for ourselves and, and see if we come up with the same numbers. But uh, for Yucatan, for instance, on a turn to flood, you add 25 minutes to the time of slack at Gillard Pass. And that's your time of slack at Yucatan. So on this day, uh, 1101 is a turn to flood, add 25 minutes, so 1126 AM is when it's slack at Yucatan. Dent is 15 minutes behind 
on a turn to flood, 25 minutes behind on a turn to ebb, so they're slightly different. Not uh, probably in, in boats your speed, it's not super critical, but it, it's nice to be as precise as we can be. And so dent, you'll subtract 15 minutes, so it's 1046. So this starts to illustrate the problem. You arrive at Yukulta first, but it's, dent has already turned. And so you're going to have to fight the current through uh, a little bit at, at dent, at Yukulta rather. At Gillard, you're going to be a little bit off. And then dent, you're targeting for right on, on slack or within 15 minutes. So let's. Uh, Let's maybe break for just a few minutes, and Sam will bring these, these books back, and then we'll have an opportunity to work through the math here and get comfortable with how we, we calculate all this. Any questions for now? Or? OK, this is going to be a dumb question. So no, no dumb, dumb question. question. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Utah, and I don't have pipes. So at 1101, you say it's that slack. Yep. And then it's going to turn to flood. So that means it's turning and so the water is flooding in. In other words, the tide is coming up. Yep. So at 1101, it'll be slack, but that'll be slack. It'll, uh, it'll be low. Yeah, low water lower. slack. And so at 558, when it turns to, to slack, I mean, turns to, what's the other one? Ebb. Turn to ebb. Turn to ebb means that at 558, the water Yep. Okay. And the, in these specific rapids, the high water or low water is, is inconsequential. There's plenty of water to get through at either one of them in terms of depth. And so you don't have to worry if you're going on a higher high tide or low tide. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is very confusing and it took a while for me to understand, is high or low tide does not necessarily correspond with slack current. And so that's because the current is a result of a difference in basically the difference in height on the, the side of an obstacle. So the water's changing faster on one side than the other, and you get the current is that flow from one side to the other. And so at, when you, the tide's dropping, 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 it starts coming back up. Slack is when they're equal, not necessarily at higher low water. A lot of places it is higher low water or pretty darn close. But it's don't make the mistake of saying, OK, I see it's low, low tide is at you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so that's slack. It's not inherently slack water at high or low tide. Does that make sense? Cool. So I'm going to pass these worksheets out. And there's, oh, one more thing. T adding and subtracting time is confusing. We get, actually, I think there's one, enough for everybody to have their own. That's two pages. Oh, you, did, you get two already? Um, adding and subtracting time, so you, it's like minus 15 minutes from 10.06. You can't just do that easily on your calculator on your phone. But there's apps that you can use for adding and subtracting time. They're free. I've got one on my phone. It makes it much easier than trying to, trying to convert everything into something that's easily calculable on the, you know, your typical your typical calculator. I'll tell you here in a moment what that, that app is. So Sam, on, on your example up here, 1101 is slack. What's happening between 1101 and 226? The, the tide is coming in yep. all, all during that time, right? The t well, the tide is actually coming in that whole time, or the, the current's flooding. The tide is not necessarily right, coming, sorry, in, because that, yeah. coming in. Yeah, it's a s kind of semantics in, at some level, but right important at another level. So from 1101 until 558 PM, the current is flooding. Okay. And halfway through that, roughly, at that 226, that's when that flood is at its highest velocity. And so there's, there's in this Ports and Passes book, you'll also see the maximum velocity somewhere in the, the range of 14 or 15 knots. And so you can see on a day that OK, we have a flood of 10 knots. So that's, that's, not, that's a big tidal exchange, but it's not one of the strongest of the year. You guys are, are you guys all planning on going up around July 20th, thereabouts? So let's look at July. Tw this is old, years, years old data. Can we, can we talk about that at some point, what, what the date range is? If we're yeah, absolutely. 
okay. Absolutely. Um, and actually, all let's. Where'd that remote go? So July, July 21st, that's kind of, I penciled that in as a day that people might be heading north from Desolation into, uh, through the rapids and, and up towards the Broughtons. That day, the flood, the maximum flood that day is 8.4 knots. So that's kind of half the, the maximum velocity you might see at uh, the biggest tidal exchanges. And so that means you've got a longer window to get through each of these rapids. The, velocities will be less than, throughout the exchange, will be less than, than they could be. So it's a pretty good day, uh, and right around that time is pretty good. Yeah. And the reason it's really good, and the, all these tide calculations, in my experience, are excellent in the United States, and the reason is that uh, NOAA gives the tidal data away for free. So the government's the one that's, that's creating all this data, and they give it to the developers to use however they want. The Canadians charge for it, and so the developers don't buy it. They do base it off of U.S. tidal stations and calculations that offset for, for various factors. Sometimes they're pretty good, other times not. And so Canadian Hydrographic Services, just as a policy, doesn't give the data away. Uh, developers don't want to pay for it, so you're, you're stuck. Like, I use Coastal Explorer on a PC a lot for navigation. I click on the rapids up there, and they're basing it off of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. We're going to step back a moment. The first thing is we have to figure out where we're coming from. And so what do we want to say? Gorge Harbor? Is that good enough for now? So Gorge Harbor is about 21 nautical miles from Yucatán Rapids. And so we can put in, in here 21 miles. We want to figure out how long that's going to take us. So 21 miles divided by your cruise speed. What, 15 knots? Is that, is that a good number for us to work on? Uh, so 21 divided by 15, so it's going to be um, 1.4 hours. Let's multiply that by 60 to get minutes, so it's going to be 84 minutes, so that's a m one hour and 24 minutes, is that right? Mm -hmm. So one hour and 24 minutes, so that gives you the uh, kind of a, a ballpark to work on. So you're not going to, on the 21st, when you have 8.13 in the morning and it's going to take an hour and 24 minutes to get there, okay, that works. You can make that happen. If it was going to be a four-hour trip to get there, oh, that 8.13 in the morning slack or 8.08 in the morning slack doesn't look so good. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of, of, oh, this is workable or this is not workable. And then continue down, figure out the time that it's going to take you to get through each of the rapids here. Um, so. From Yucatan to Gillard, it's 2.2 miles. I better write this down so I, we're, we're all on the same page. 2.2 miles at 15 knots. So it's nine minutes or so. Not much to, to worry about. I'm gonna, I don't have an extra pen back here. Yep. I have one somewhere, but. Thank you. Yeah. Your question was excellent, by the way, but I have a stupid one now. Why are we adding five at this point? And how do I know it's five and not 25? And yes, and that will be, so go to the very first page of Gillard Pass. There, this is the easiest way to look at it is the very first page of Gillard Pass, which is the page number. It's going to be 190, 194, this page. And this has a nice chartlet that shows, shows all the rapids. Gillard Pass is the one in the middle where this red dot is. Okay. And then you can look back at Yucalta and it says TTF, that's turn to flood. You add 25 minutes to the Gillard Pass time. For a turn to ebb, you add five minutes. And so you're just pulling that, that five minutes and, and uh, 25 minutes okay. here and here um, is just purely off this page. And Dent Rapids on a turn to flood, minus 15 minutes. Turn to ebb, minus 25 minutes. Um, there's also this table in the very end of this book where you get secondary current and tide stations. Uh, that can be useful for, for other, other locations. It's quite the book to use. <laughs> Is 
So everybody uh, starting to understand the, how we're getting the, this primary, which is Gillard Pass, and the secondaries, which are Dent and Eucleta? All right, so depart we've got, what, an hour and 24 minutes, and then we have nine minutes, and then we have another seven minutes or so. So our total travel time is, an, what, an hour 24, an hour an hour 33, an hour and 40 minutes. Is that about what you guys all got? Anybody struggling to figure out how that, how we arrived at that? How do you know your distance? You just do that from the chart Yeah, I, do, I use Navionics for that. I just plug in the, where I, you know, auto route from where I started and where I'm gonna end. And it's a close enough approximation that it, it works for the planning. Does that, does that work well with Garmin? So Garmin owns Navionics now. Your your Garmin plotters probably all have the auto routing function. Yes. Yeah, so okay. You, uh, okay. So you need blue, the blue chart vision chip to make the auto routing work. But I I would caution you to if you're using auto routing, make sure that you're double checking that if you're navigating by it. But for the purposes of of getting a, a distance estimate for timing, how long it's going to take. <laughs> Uh, I use Navionics. It'll also give you, you can program in your boat speed on Navionics. And so it'll say it's, okay, 20.4 miles. For me, that's three hours and 13 minutes or whatever. And you can change your boat speed here. Um, so it'll do the time and distance calculation for you. Not perfect, but good enough for our, our planning purposes. Okay, so we've got, an, it's going to be an hour and 40 minutes for us to get to Dent Rapids. That's what we're assuming, 15 knot cruise speed. We've got our distances, an hour and 40 minutes. So then we can start looking at the times that are going to work. So uh, an hour and 40, we want to get to Dent at, say, 7.43 in the morning. Um, and we haven't calculated that yet, but we'll get there in a moment. That would mean you're going to be leave about 6 o'clock in the morning. Do you like leaving that early or not? And then you might say, okay, we're going to go later on in the day. There's plenty of light at 6 in the morning to leave, but you might prefer to be sleeping at that hour. So now we're going to calculate the time of slack. We looked at uh, here how we determine a, a turn to flood or a turn to ebb, right? And so we see that, that on the 21st, Let's go to July 21st, Gillard Pass, and okay, 8.08 a.m. We have a turn to ebb, and that's only going to be a turning to five and a half knot ebb, so that's a nice gentle ebb, but you still don't want to cheat it too much. Uh, at 152, it's going to be slack again, and then it's going to be a turn to flood. So let's then on the turn to ebb, Who wants to leave at 6 and who wants to leave at, in the afternoon? Do we? We'll, we'll do it based on 6, six. kind of the, the morning slack. That gives us lots of time and we can hit the afternoon slack if we have a problem. So we, we'd want to leave a little bit earlier, but first we've got to calculate the time. So we've determined it's a turn to ebb. So on the second page, go to J and we can put in that's Gillard Pass 808 a.m. Eucleta, we add five minutes and I know that I added it in here already and we'll uh, make these sheets available if you want so you can fill them out as you're cruising and and use them kind of to, to make sure that everything's looking good. So we add five minutes that's 813 uh, at Dent Rapids, we're going to subtract 25 minutes, so that worked out to 7.43 in the morning. We don't worry about the turn to flood timing right now because we've decided we want to go on the, that morning ebb, turn to ebb. And then we're going to figure out what time we need to leave. So we're going to take the time of, we want to hit Dent Rapids right around Slack. So we're going to take Dent Rapids at 7.43. So if it's a turn to ebb, you're going to subtract 25 minutes. 
if it's a turn to flood, you're going to subtract 15 minutes. And it, it, this is in the realm of it's not super important on, on fast boats because you're going to be, uh, you're not going to be there perfectly at, you know, within the minute probably. But the the more precision we can get, the better. Remember, these are also predictions, the tidal predictions. They're not uh, they're not perfect, and so if there's been a, a bunch of wind from the same direction for many days, that might shift things a little bit. If there's been a whole bunch of runoff from, from heavy rain or snow melt, that might shift things a little bit. But this is what we start based off of, uh, and then we're, the rest of it's looking in, looking in binoculars and feeling what the boat's doing. And um, if you're within you know, plus or minus 15 minutes, you're, you're going to be golden, especially on a day like the 21st where there's not a huge tidal exchange. So 7.43 in the morning, minus an hour and 40 minutes of transit. So that gets us to 6.03 as a departure. That doesn't give you any margin, though, if things aren't going perfectly. So I like to leave that half an hour or so extra. That way, if you see whales, if you have a, you know choppier weather than you thought and you need to slow down, whatever it is, you have a little bit of margin. You can always wait later on. And so we're at. Um, the departure time for that would probably, be, I'd want to leave Gorge Harbor to hit the 8, uh, that kind of 8 o'clock morning slack. I'd want to leave about 5.30 probably. Um, yeah. And when we went up uh, to Gorge last night, we had a group of uh, different types of boats. And some were faster, some were slower, and so on. And I guess uh, if you go up as a crew, some would probably want to think to leave a little bit earlier if the boats are slower or, or some would catch up being faster. And so yep, absolutely. We tend to, well, I, we have run into this issue every year going north because we've got boats that range in speed dramatically. And so we like to have people, we set up a, a time to rendezvous just south of Yukulta. And how, how fast you get there is not my concern. <laughs> Um, you just got to get to that point by that time, and so uh, that, with especially with the variation in speed of the of boats here, that might make a lot of sense. Um, you know, at seven knots, that doesn't look so good. Going at at you're leaving at four, some, three something, four something in the morning if you're going to do this at seven knots, um, and so then you might say, oh, I want to go from start my day not at Gorge Harbor. I want to start closer. Uh, I want to hit that afternoon slack something different than the than everything. And let's if you guys have specific days you're interested in, we can keep keep working through these a few times so that we're comfortable with, with how we get to the the numbers. Are you guys is this making sense to people? Are you feeling more comfortable with the calculating the times of, of Slack? Anyone want to do another one? Let's do another one while we're here. So let's say 26, 27. 26, 27th. All right. Let's do the the 26th here. So page 199, right? We see that on the 26th, there's 6.15 in the morning. That's one slack. That's going to be too early. There's just no way you're going to make it from Gorge Harbor to, to the rapids by 6.15. So that puts us into that 1.29 p.m. Okay, we'll do. A, let's do a seven knot. We'll do a, assume a seven knot cruise for this one. All right. So, one twenty-nine p.m. Is that a turn to a flood or a turn to an ebb? Excellent. And look at those velocities. They're really nice and low. So that's a day when you probably have a pretty wide window to get through those rapids. So 129, let's, let's, that's a turn to ebb, so we're going to use the same. And we'll go to uh, 129 plus 5, so that's 1, Gillard Pass is 134 p.m. That's a very civilized hour to be transiting. And Dent Rapids is minus 25 minutes from 129, so that's going to be 104. 
And then let's go back to the first page and we'll do our time and distance again. And so 20, we're using 21 miles. Make sure you're, you, you keep consistent. It doesn't matter if you're using nautical miles or statute miles or knots or miles per hour. Just make sure your units are the same across the board. Yeah, in, in theory. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's clo as close as we can get to. Uh, plus or minus 5 and 25, plus or minus. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's always a little margin. Uh, OK, let's look at the calculator. So 21 miles, well, that, that 7 knots is going to take us 3 hours. And then 2.2 miles at 7 knots is going to take us about 19 minutes. And from uh, 1.8 miles divided by 7 knots, that's going to be about 16, 15, 16 minutes. We'll do 16 just to be safe. I get, we're calculating this quite precisely, but in reality, you've got that window 15, 20 minutes on either side, and it's okay. You'll On a day like this where you have a really small exchange, you have a longer window. Um, so if you're, if you're off by five, six minutes on your arrival, don't sweat it. Things will be fine. So we're at our total time then is three hours, uh, three hours and three hours and 35. Is that right? 335. Is our elapsed time? So let's say we want to leave. Then we wanted to get to Dent at 104. So let's take take it back three hours, three and a half hours from one, and um, it's at 9:30 in the morning, roughly. 9:30, you'll, and then you probably want to give yourself that extra half hour in case things don't go well. So leave Gorge Harbor about nine. Get up to Yukulta, scope it out when it looks like it's calm enough. Zoom through, and I suspect you could go an hour, an hour early at, at Yukulta on a, a day with like the 26th with that tidal exchange. It's going to be no problem. Um, you'll scoot through and keep going through Gillard and look at the eagles on Jimmy Judd Island, and then continue to Dent. And Dent will be nice and slack, and you'll uh, you'll have conquered the rapids for that day. Can you go back to the map? Yeah, you find the remote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, help me visualize again. When we're on an ebb, which direction is it? Okay, yeah, let me actually back up here. This, I think this one will be good. So, what happens, and the reason Desolation Sound has such warm water is because the currents come from both ends of Vancouver Island and they converge right around Desolation Sound, and so you don't have a big net exchange of water. So, when you're heading up to Desolation Sound, the water's flooding this way and ebbing that way. But north of Desolation Sound, it floods this way um, and ebbs back out around Vancouver Island. So, uh, it's right, right around here, kind of, that, that it shifts, and it's not exactly precise, but um, somewhere in, in that area, the, the ebbs meet, or the floods meet, uh, and the ebbs diverge. And so if you, you really, the, if you're northbound, a turn to ebb is awesome because then you get to ride the ebb out Johnstone Strait, and it gives you a nice boost in speed. Less important at 15 knots, but at seven knots, if you have a you know, four or five knot current, suddenly it's, it's either awesome because you got all this free fuel or wow this is slow <laughs> you know watching your speed over ground dip to to 1.5 knots is not fun and you start hitting the throttle and burning some fuel at that point yeah you had mentioned when taking johnstone straight the whole way it can get a little rough because if the current's going out the wind's coming in it mm -hmm. rough. what about coming back the other way it, boats tend to do a lot better in following seas. They're more comfortable. Like you don't get the, quite the same pounding that you get when you're heading into head seas. And so I, if, the, if it works out that the weather, the, the 
wind conditions are pretty mild, you know, 10, 15 knots, then by all means run down Johnstone Strait. And especially if you're, you know, if you're coming from the north, heading south, and you can ride a flood. Like I've, I've ridden a flood all the way from Port McNeil down here with 20 knots, 25 knots of wind behind me. And it was great. I was doing, at eight knots of boat speed, I was doing 13 knots over the ground. And um, for a cheapskate like me, I just, I love free fuel. <laughs> Um, so you can use that to your advantage, but don't, the other thing is don't, tr don't worry too much about it. Uh, make the timing right for the, what you want to do and the weather that you have. Uh, and if you burn a little extra fuel for 12 miles, then, then so be it. Does that help? Coming south, the rapids are wonderful because they turn in the right order. So you can hit them all at slack. <laughs> um, but going north, you have to, to cheat a little bit. What's, uh, on, on, on average, what's the difference in distance between going Johnstone versus the secondary route? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. I think in, the, in overall distance, you're not looking at more than a 15 mile, 10, 15 miles, probably. And there's so many places to stop in this area between the Broughtons <coughs> and Desolation Sound. There are six, six or seven, six marinas maybe, a few anchorages. Um, so I. Unless you're in a rush, I would definitely go the back way. And you're exposed for like 50 some odd miles on, on Johnstone, right? Yeah, and the, you, know, you are exposed, but you, there are a lot of places you can duck out if the conditions worsen. So if you're out on doing the, the kind of the highway route straight up, uh, Johnstone straight, you can always duck out into any of these channels and seek shelter. Uh, so it, it doesn't have to be a strictly the highway or the back way. It can be a combination that you make at your own uh, discretion. Let's see if I had, yeah. Like a lot of times, there's a nice resort in here we'll talk about in a minute called Blind Channel. And if we go, we come out of Blind Channel in the morning and it, the weather is great on Johnstone, we might just pop out here and go Johnstone the rest of the way. If we wake up and it's really blowing, then we'll take the back way up here, spend a night at Forward Harbor, hope the next day is better, uh, and then continue up. But we'll, we'll talk about this more in, in a moment. Okay. Are you going to talk about um, anchoring gear at some point? I, well, I actually, I, anchoring, I don't have any slides about it specifically, but anchoring gear is really no different than desolation, except you won't have to stern tie. So I can't stand stern tying. It's a lot of extra work. and. And uh, I'm alone on the boat a lot of times. It's hard to get to shore and with a stern line and have the boat not drift off in some other direction. So there, there are not nearly as many boats in the Broughtons, and so the stern tying isn't as important. Um, depth, if you, depth is manageable, OK? Enough. Yeah, depth is, is similar to what be comfortable anchoring in you know, 60, 50, 60 feet kind of thing. And uh, Would you recommend a spare anchor? Is it, does that get fouled very often in the I don't know. If you don't have a spare anchor, I don't know that I'd go to the hassle and expense of getting one and storing one on a, a boat you know, a, a, these, this size. It's kind of something you're not going to probably need, and it takes up a bunch of room. There's all, there are marinas close by in case you need it. You can always go over to Port McNeil and get an, buy another set uh, or have it chipped in. One other thing to think about, oh, we'll we can talk about this more later too. The, if you get to Port McNeil and you need something, and they don't have it in Port McNeil and you're on a schedule, you can rent a car in Port McNeil or Port Hardy and you can drive down to Campbell River in an afternoon. You could drive down all the way to Sydney. Um, I mean, the supplies are available if you're, if you're eager to get them and willing to put a little bit of effort in. So, you know, I'm kind of on the paranoid side and so I, of course, carry a spare set of ground tackle. But if I was just going up to the Broughtons for the first time and um, I don't know that I would go to the expense and trouble of, of finding a place for a whole spare anchor and, and road. If you're buddy boating with other people too, then it really mitigates that need because you can always, you can always raft up to friends. Or Once you leave Desolation Sound, first thing you do is go through those three sets of rapids that we just talked about. And then you kind of, it opens up into this whole area uh, here. And there's, like I said, a half dozen or so marinas in there. I recommend you leave Desolation Sound and plan on getting the Broughtons three, four days later. Uh, however, if the weather is good on Johnstone, and we'll talk about that at the end of this section, 
if the weather is good, go through the rapids, spend the night, and then take Johnstone the next morning and, and just get it over with. There's no sense in waiting until the weather gets worse. <laughs> and so the, the summer pattern, we'll talk about this extensively, is for kind of building northwesterly winds in the afternoon. And you'll want them to try to get through there in the morning probably. And, and there's a nice weather station that'll show you real time what to expect. Um, but here's kind of a, an outline of an itinerary that we like using, which is say Gorge Harbor to a place called Shoal Bay. I'll talk about this in a moment. That day you go through the rapids. Spend the night at Shoal Bay. The next night you can go on to Blind Channel. Uh, Blind Channel is a nice resort. We'll talk about that here in a moment too. And then the following day, head up to Lagoon Cove in the Broughtons. And that's going to be your day you're going through uh, Johnstone Strait and you're going to want to make sure the weather is good. So if on, say, day two, you wake up and they say Fanny Island is uh, wind light, hit the throttle and go. Uh, you'll be in the Broughtons by lunchtime, and, and then you don't have to worry about the weather for, for quite some time again. So these are the, the six places, um, kind of marinas, that you can stop at between Desolation Sound and the Broughtons. So there's the Stewart Island Community Dock. That is right between Gillard Pass and Yukultar Rapids. So when you come through Yukultar, you'll look to the right, and there's a big set of docks, and that is Stewart Island Community Dock. Uh, it's a nice place to bail out to if you come through Yukultar and you're, you're kind of freaked out. You, maybe the timing wasn't quite as good as you hoped. Pull into the dock here, regather your thoughts, uh, look at, double check the tide information. Just make sure you're watching the current of the dock. I watched a sailboat uh, come in there one year on a, a pretty big tidal exchange with a charter boat and they didn't have a clue what they were doing. The, they had a, were towing a rigid inflatable dinghy and they, uh, they got that between the boat and the, the dock and they, they crunched it. So there can be pretty swift currents in there. Be alert as you're approaching the dock about that. But if you're coming through at slack, it, it won't be, or near slack, you won't have any trouble. There's a good cell phone signal here, so it's a nice place to uh, catch up on communications if you need it. There's a little store. There's no power on the docks. Um, there's hiking trails. It's kind of a, a quaint little spot. The next one you're going to see is just a little further on. That's Dent Island Lodge. This is owned by the Nordstrom family, apparently, and it's uh, kind of the, well, it's what you'd expect. It's beautiful and immaculately done, great service, fabulous meals. The most expensive marina on the coast, I think, uh, 450 a foot a night. That's Canadian, so it's a little better. Dinner's like 130 bucks a head or something like that. Um, this is a, a lot of people will, will come here as a treat yourself on the way home or, or something like that. I think they have a spa and they have the jet boat tours and fishing charters, and it's a, a full service, high end kind of place. And all these places take credit, or do you need cash? Yeah, credit cards are taken all, at almost all the places here. I like to travel with a little bit of cash just for incidental stuff or you know, maybe a few hundred dollars worth of Canadian currency. Um, they'll take U.S. currency, but they normally don't give you a very good exchange rate. So there's then Fisherman's Landing, that's right nearby. And all these are in the Wagner Guide, and they have a nice chartlet that shows where they are in relation to each other. So. We're going to kind of zoom through these, just showing you options. And then uh, if you have questions about them, feel free to ask, and, and we can go through it. Where is that, Sam? Where is Fisherman's? Yeah. It's right past Dent Island Lodge, basically. Um, I hear the, I don't have a good map of it in here, but it will. Uh, there's a, so there are three chapters that you'll really use on this trip. There's the Johnstone Strait section. And that, that has this nice map that shows where all these places are. Uh, the numbers correspond to, of course, the, the different destinations. So Fisherman's Landing, it used to be called Morgan's Landing. They've got new owners. Um, and that's right, right by Dent Island, um, kind of in the, in the, still in the Rapids area. I tend to like getting past, if, if I've got a good run to get through the Rapids, which, which I think you all will on the, the timing that you're looking like. I like going past all three of these that I've just mentioned and heading, then you're, then you're kind of through the, the rapids for the, the northbound trip. Um, I like Shoal Bay a lot. This is, Denham Bay is a, a nice spot. There's a charted but unmarked rock off there, you, off the dock, um, just to, to keep an eye out on. Cabins, of course, if you, if you have guests who are on the boat but you 
don't want to have them spend the night on the boat. No power there, but a nice group destination. There's kind of a <laughs> gathering place that you can hang out on and cook dinner together, things like that. Shoal Bay is probably my favorite of all the destinations in that this area between the Broughtons and, and Desolation Sound. It's a public dock, so it's first come, first serve. Rafting's required. Uh, but there's a nice energy there. It's friendly people in my experience. Everybody's happy to be there. The view up Phillips Arm from the dock here is just incredible. There's nice spacious grounds that you can walk around and uh, a good hike up to a, an old gold mine if you are trying to get some serious exercise. The anchorage here is kind of marginal. Uh, I've done it, but if you're not comfortable anchoring, definitely try to get a spot on the dock. Um, if you're going to be up there at the beginning of August, keep in mind this music festival. It's a, I've never been because I'm, a, I'm, I'm normally somewhere else in August, but it's supposed to be a blast. I know a lot of people who go up every year just for the music festival. Uh, anybody can play in this music festival as long as you have an instrument with you. <laughs> it, it's very casual. It's not like the fire festival. <laughs> um, and there's this, this cool little pub. It's really just a house. Um, and they have cold beer and wine, and uh, that might be cash only. So good to have a little bit of cash. Um, but it, Mark is the owner, and kind of go sit on the, the deck and look up the, the channel at this incredible view and meet people around you and, and chat with other cruisers. And um, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy this spot. Do they take reservations there? No reservations. Mark, who, who owns the pub, collects moorage. Um, They'll take checks there. I don't think they'll take credit cards there, so that, uh, good to have cash. The private marinas pretty much all take credit cards, at least Visa and MasterCard. Amex is a little harder. Blind Channel is my other kind of favorite go-to spot along this section. It's a really well-run marina. The Richter family owns it. And, and one of the cool things is you get, particularly into the Broughtons, is you know the marina by the, the families that own them and operate them. It's a very personal business and a small business. And so uh, Elliot uh, Richter is the, the kind of the generation that's running it now. And he's got two little kids who are starting to get, get into things. Uh, they've got a really good facilities here, power and good potable water. They've got a fuel dock, uh, decent internet. A pretty good store there, a good restaurant, cabins. There's a nice walk through the woods to this giant old cedar tree. They'll give you a map and uh, directions. One thing to keep in mind if you're wandering around on shore is have bear spray with you and make noise. There are bears in this whole area, uh, including Desolation Sound. Bear spray is, is a permissible in Canada. It just has to be labeled as bear spray. The personal mace is not permitted, but can you but take it across the border or you have to buy it there? No, you can take it across the border. I declare it every time. I, you know, do you have any weapons on board? I say, no, but I do have a can of bear spray. They normally ask, is this, uh, is this labeled for bear use? You say, yes. Um, it, would you ever use this on a person? Absolutely not. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Right. Unless they're after my liquor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the bears, the, I buy the stuff at, at REI or, and you know, has a big picture of a bear on it and counter assault <laughs> or something. And I've never had any customs person hassle me for it. Have you ever used it on a bear? I have never used it on a bear, thankfully. You read the instructions. It's kind of sobering when you, when you realize how close the thing has to get before you should use it. Uh, it's kind of a cone that disperses it within 15 feet of you or something. So it's, and you only have about seven seconds, I think, of spray. Yeah. It's better just to spray yourself so you won't know what the bear's doing. <laughs> yeah, use it just like bug spray. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've, heard it, I've heard it's used to spray somebody else in your party so you can get away. <laughs> uh, you, bears are pretty darn skittish, typically. Make lots of noise if you're going hiking or through the woods or you're landing with a, a dog on shore and and my experience 100 percent of the time is the bear runs off are, they, are there black bears and grizzlies in this area or are they just black bears i think they're just black bears but but don't quote me on that they're um, um, actually i think it's like the core devil is supposed to be grizzlies up that area oh yeah the on the mainland side they're yeah. on the islands i think it's mostly black bears but <laughs> bears bears <laughs> Yeah, whether it's 400 pounds or 800, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be close. 
They're fun to watch from a dinghy or a kayak, though. And you mm -hmm. kind of have that separation <laughs> between <laughs> between you and the. Maybe a black bear just kills the slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well the, di the difference is that if it climbs the tree to get you, it's a black bear. Yeah. If it knocks the tree down, it's a black bear. <laughs> Be bears should be the least of your uh, your concern. Running out of beer is a much more serious <laughs> problem. And so we have two more rapids then before we get out into Johnstone Strait. If you're going to go the back way, and these are Greenpoint Rapids, and Greenpoint is right around the corner from uh, from Blind Channel. So if you leave Blind Channel within t 10 minutes, you're in in Greenpoint Rapids. And again, we have a problem here. They're 11 miles apart and the one you get to last has turned first. Uh, and so it's the same issue that we've had at, at the other rapids, but they're much further apart here. The good news is, and, and so here's Blind Channel Resort. This is, is Greenpoint. This over here is Whirlpool. The good news is these aren't that critical to get the timing right. And the velocities are about seven knots at the max. A lot of, most of these times you're going to be going through and the, the dates we looked at the velocities are going to be half that, maybe, thereabouts. Greenpoint is a primary in ports and passes. And so it's right after Gillard Pass. Oh, and it looks like I spelled it wrong. There's an E on the end of, of green. But so let's look on the 27th, say, of July. That was the day after. Uh, the 27th, the maximum flood is 4.5 knots. The maximum ebb is 3.2 knots. That kind of stuff you can really kind of go through any time you want. We've, we've taken Katie Krogan's and Nordhaven's and sailboats through these rapids with, with 4 or 5 knots of current behind us. You don't want to do it if, uh, if you're challenging it in a boat that slow. But the, the flow is laminar. Uh, it's pretty smooth. You don't get the big whirlpools and standing waves. So don't worry too much about these. You know, maybe try to get within an hour of slack. The, the faster boat you, uh, the faster boats that you guys have makes it possible to get them, hit these closer than on uh, you know a seven or eight knot boat. But, but don't don't stress too much about these two rapids. You can pretty much run them whenever you want. So whirlpool rapid doesn't have a whirlpool. No, there's some turbulence on the big exchanges, but it, the turbulence is mostly on the down, after the choke point. So if it's uh, so right here's the narrowest point uh, on the, the flood. The current's coming this way. And the, the turbulence is going to be on this side. On the ebb, the water is going that way. And the turbulence is going to be in here. Nothing that, that is hazardous, typically. What about the debris? Do you find there's a lot of debris in this, in this, going up this area? Great question. Is there a lot of debris? And there can be, especially when you've had a big tide recently. A lot of stuff gets lifted off the beaches during the highest tides. Sometimes a, a log, uh, one of the log barges will break apart or something, and, and you'll get a bunch of debris. But it, it tends to kind of come in packs, in my experience. And so you, if you see some debris, really keep a sharp lookout for more. And yeah, we've we've seen some big logs in in this area, and um, it's definitely something to be aware of. Thankfully, I, there's a lot of concern about the logs, uh, and I've never actually heard of a boat having any serious damage other than propellers um, from from hitting logs. I'm sure it happens, but generally, it's not not you know it makes a nasty noise and maybe a little little scuff. But these boats aren't. You don't hear about boats hitting logs and sinking all the time or anything like that. There was a case in Johnstone Strait a couple years ago. Something that Grady White was cruising along at 25 knots or so, and a whale breached right in front of him. And he, this Grady White T-boned, I think it was a humpback or a gray whale. Uh, the owner of the boat, the operator of the boat, went through the windshield, and somehow the boat was OK, and the, uh, the owner needed some plastic surgery, and nobody knows what happened to the whale. but. Uh, that's a real fluky situation. <laughs> so Whirlpool, you're going to have to do a calculation. This is based on Seymour Narrows. Um, so you'll find the Seymour Narrows section in here. It's all done by alphabet. And you'll, you'll subtract an hour, 40, hour, 50, depending on if it's turned to flood, turned to ebb. It's a good exercise, and I think you should be in the habit of figuring out when you're going to be going through in the tide cycle. Uh, but generally, like I said, don't worry too much about these two rapids. It's just good to be aware. 
So this is the last, Forward Harbor is this last anchorage before you head out into Johnstone Strait. It's a cool spot. I really like Forward Harbor. Uh, we spent, we stopped there twice last summer on, on various flotilla trips. There's decent cell phone service if you have a booster and maybe without. Uh, and you can pull up the weather information for Johnstone Strait, see if it's a kind of a no-go, go, no-go uh, in the morning and, and then head out from there. The summer pattern, like I mentioned before, is for the northwesterly. So the wind's coming down this way. This is Forward Harbor here. You can anchor up in this bay right there or at the head of the bay. In the northwest, summertime northwesterly, the head of the bay can be kind of windy. Uh, the wind just funnels through the harbor. The chop generally isn't too bad, but it can be annoying to listen to all night um, if it doesn't die off, and it can just be a little bit bumpy. So if you head in here, I like if you can get a, a spot to anchor right in, in that nook. Um, yeah, pleasant enough spot. I know people who've spent three or four days there because just they were just waiting for, for weather on Johnstone Strait. That's not super common, but it's not terribly uncommon either. And, and we'll talk about Johnstone Strait right now. Um, here's our, this is, this is Forward Harbor, which I was just, just, just describing. You head out here, there's your, your 12 miles in Johnstone Strait and then you're back into the Broughtons. Don't be discouraged when you listen to the radio or pull up the forecast from Environment Canada and it says, wind northwest building to 25 to 35 knots. And they'll, they'll say this all summer long. Um, and it's not, not to be uh, worried about too much because a lot of times that is an afternoon wind, a worst case, um, what you're really looking for is an hour in the day when you can sneak through uh, and not have have big winds that's typically going to be in the morning uh, and there's an island right here called fanny island and fanny island has a weather reporting site station on it and so you listen for fanny island report or look it up on your phone uh, and we can do a demonstration of how you look this stuff up in just a minute but fanny island right there is going to be your kind of barometer for whether or not you should go up Johnstone Strait because it doesn't really matter what that forecast says. If it's calm at Fanny Island, that's a really good sign. It's not going to be calm at Fanny Island and blowing 40 knots right here. Um, you're going you're gonna to have pretty, pretty similar conditions that, uh, at Fanny Island all the way up to uh, where you turn into the Broughtons. Robson Bight is worth mentioning mainly because it's a, an area that's protected. Uh, there's a, a area that's kind of um, a natural, some kind of a natural reserve type place for uh, orca whales. It's a good, outside of it is a good place to watch orcas, but you have to be careful you don't go into the, the protected area. It's on the charts and mentioned on the, in the, the guidebooks for the area. And what, what's the path that the uh, cruise ships typically take? Yeah, the cruise ships take the highway route. So they'll go through Seymour, uh, they'll all hit Seymour close to Slack and then run up Johnstone and so it's not uncommon. To, this, is, this is a pretty heavily trafficked area. Cruise ships out of Vancouver heading up to Alaska go through there. Tugs and barges go through there. Um, Are they pushing big wakes when they, when they go? I found the cruise ship wakes aren't typically that bad. They're more of a swell than, a, than the kind of nasty wake you get from a 50-foot powerboat pushing a lot of water. So something to be aware of, but not feared. And, they're also very responsive if you were arranging passing or um, you're, you're worried about them. Call them on channel 13 and they'll, uh, they'll respond. That's, channel 13 is a good one to keep in mind for all commercial traffic. They're not necessarily Washington State Ferries or, or shipping. Uh, they're not necessarily monitoring 16, but all the big guys are on, on 13 and a VA, uh, VTS channel, which varies depending on, on where you are. So yeah, there's VTS is the vessel traffic service, and they they control the commercial shipping and and uh, large yachts all the way up to Prince Rupert. They don't. There's no VTS in Alaska, but from Olympia up to Prince Rupert, BC, there's there's VTS. Do you, do you typically run two radios at the same time? I typically do, but it's not necessary. I do it because I'm traveling with a group, and so it's nice to have one on 16 and one on 
a group frequency. Yeah, and it's it's really some people you'll hear this from time to time. There'll be a few boats traveling together, and every, every five minutes they're hailing each other on 16, saying, just "Come on, move your ship. Just keep a radio on, <laughs> even if it's a handheld. Keep a radio on 68 or 69 or or whatever your working channel is, and keep the traffic off of channel 16." The nice thing in here, for a lot of us, the, the least comfortable motion on the boat is a beam C when you're rolling. Uh, Johnstone straight, you're pretty much going to be in a head C or a following C. And so the following C is typically you can get away with a, a bigger, bigger waves and higher, higher winds than head C's. Head C's you start to pound a bit. But I find it a lot more comfortable than, say, crossing the Strait of Georgia where you're, it's more of a wallowing, rolling motion. So the, the number one weather resource for Johnstone Strait is going to be that Environment Canada forecast. And then you're going to really want to pay attention to the Fanny Island light station. Down here, there's also um, the Chatham Point light station. That'll give you some, some pertinent weather, but it's so far away from where most of you will be. Um, you know, that this is a, probably a 15-mile gap, and things can change in there. So pay most attention to Fanny Island uh, when you're coming out into Johnstone Strait. Oops. And be cautious of the, the various private forecasts like windy.com, windfinder. The winds in Johnstone Strait tend to be amplified by local effects. They kind of get funneled through Johnstone. And these, we found these private forecasts are not particularly accurate. And so definitely look at them. It's good to pay attention, but uh, don't, don't put too much faith in the private forecast. And what, what's the temperature typically like that time of year? In July and August, yeah. you're looking at uh, hopefully not smoky this year mm -hmm. like it's been, but probably mm -hmm. 50s at night, 70s <coughs> in the day, 60s, 70s in the day. Sometimes it'll be really hot and you'll want, uh, you know, people will go swimming and, and all that, but the water temperature cools way off as you head out of Desolation Sound. Uh, you get more of that exchange of water and, and colder temps. Oops. So in, say you get out to Johnstone Strait, things aren't going well, you're not liking it, uh, duck out into Port Neville. And there's a, a free public dock in there. It's not particularly big, but it's first come, first serve. You can also anchor in there. There's tons of room to anchor. It's not a, a real exciting destination, but uh, when it's bumpy enough that you want to duck in, it, it's a very welcome destination. I think that uh, hopefully you'll you'll get a nice day of weather, uh, and you'll you know within a few day range. You typically don't have to wait more than than maybe three or four days, and that's kind of the longer end of things. But nice to be able to if you're getting pounded out on Johnstone, duck into Port Neville, wait it out, uh, and continue on once the weather improves. If a front does come through and you're starting to get you know swells, you don't want to tackle. How long does it take those to calm down? They calm down really fast. And so if, if it's within, a, my experience in Johnstone is within hours of the wind dying, the, the waves are gone. It's, you don't get ocean swells in there. It's just that short interval coastal chop. And so you know, it can be blowing 30 knots until midnight, <coughs> and by 6 the next morning, it's nice and calm, assuming the wind drops off. And that's where that Fanny Island light station uh, or weather reporting station really comes in handy because you'll be able to see and you can look historically um, for the last 24 hours and you can see what the wind speed's been each hour. Is that Fanny Island, is that a web uh, station that you're talking about? Yeah, let me, uh, it's, well, you'll hear it on the continuous marine broadcast if you can bear to listen to the 40 minute loop in French. And <laughs> 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 but uh, it's also, I'm just gonna end this quickly and see if I can. All right. It was down. This was down the other. Oh yeah. See, unfortunately, it's right now. It's it's broken, so it's not a good example. It's not apparently not windy at all. Huh? But you can log in here, and you can see the past 24-hour conditions. 
Make sure you note the units. This is kilometers per hour right now. Uh, mm -hmm. That I've I, I've woken up in the morning and some people will have texted and they say, we can't believe it's blowing you know 30 knots out there. And no, that's 30 kilometers per hour. That's like half the so it's somewhere around 15 knots I think and uh, much more mild than than it appears when you see it in in kilometers. So okay, we got a few we got a few reports here. Uh, this thing might be solar powered, so in the winter it not a lot of sun, but super useful to look at this historical data. So whether you're a, and what I would do is I would start looking at this when you're say leaving when you're coming through the rapids, start looking at the forecast, start looking at the the current conditions and the past 24 hour conditions. And if you see an opening, take it. Um, you don't want to, like I said, you don't want to wait for it to, to get worse. And similarly, if it looks like it's going to be bad for four or five days, don't rush through that whole area between Desolation and the Broughtons uh, in a day, only to wait at, at Forward Harbor for five days. You know, you slow down, enjoy the places along the way, put, put along, and then seize the opening when it comes. So, so how easy is it to get access to the internet during that, that time frame to get these updated reports? Uh, the, if you have a decent data plan, it's, you'll get cell phone service. Uh, you should get cell phone service in Port, in Forward Harbor. Um, Blind Channel has internet. Shoal Bay has internet you can get on at the pub. And there's no cell phone service at Shoal Bay. But there, there's Wi-Fi. And so, you, and coming through the rapids, when you're coming through Yucleta and Dent and Gillard, you'll have some service. So there's, there's opportunities to pick it up along the way. If you have an inReach, you can uh, train people back home to read the uh, forecast. And you text them and say, hey, relay this to me, and they can copy and paste it into the, the message that they're sending you. I do that all the time. Yeah. It's a, a Garmin device now. Great. If you're going to be cruising a lot on, in remote places, it's a, a real cool device. All right, we're going to now dive into Broughton's Marinas uh, and then North Vancouver Island Marinas, and then we'll be, we'll be done. I would recommend when you come up this way, you can go to all these marinas, a few of them, but don't, don't just go to all of them in a row. Go spend a night at a marina, then a few nights at Anchor, uh, kind of switch it up. You'll have to figure out what works for you and, and kind of what you like doing most, and, uh, and that's adjust your, your schedule accordingly. But I'm just giving you the kind of running through the options, and then uh, we can chat more about what might make sense for your trip. The first one, Port Harvey, I think sadly they're going to be closed. The owner just passed away unexpectedly last summer. Uh, this was a nice stop, the first one you got to after coming up through Johnstone Strait. And it was always a kind of a, whew, we're here, we're good. We uh, go out and have a, he make, made pizza and fish and chips, but it sounds like uh, George has wife Gail is not going to continue on so probably won't be able to go there it might be a place that you can tie up at your own risk but there's not going to be don't count any amenities so Lagoon Cove is the next one and Lagoon Cove is a, a really neat place they just got uh, purchased by the Ryan family a couple years ago this is some of the Ryan family here and it's kind of like summer camp for adults here and at, at a few others but here in particular They've got some upland area where you can walk around and the kind of a, a workshop where there's some quaint, funny old stuff. Uh, exercise machines like a lawnmower that you push and a, <laughs> a outboard motors that you start and very practical workout gear. So fun place. They've got good moorage, uh, fuel, water. Uh, they've got power and season, a little store. So a nice spot. Make reservations if you're going to be there in peak season. June is a real quiet time for most of these places, but July and August are, are peak season. They understand if you're coming up and, and hey, the weather's not cooperating on Johnstone, we're not able to get to our reservation. Just try to communicate that if, if you're not going to be arriving as expected. So night inlet. This is kind of the only weather concern in the Broughtons. This is Night Inlet. It goes way up there. Beautiful area. Uh, but as you, Lagoon Cove is right in this area. If you cross 
night inlet. Sometimes you get big inflow or outflow winds and it can get kind of choppy in, on the short crossing of night inlet. Something to be aware of, not, don't, don't concern yourself overly with it. Just be aware that that might be a, a little bit bumpier a section if you have uh, big inflow or outflow winds. So Pierre's, this is gonna be, um, for most of you, a, a major destination and Pierre's is a blast. Uh, if you haven't seen Pierre at the boat show, I recommend you go and visit him. I, does anyone know the booth that he's in? Okay, nine, nine, well, and you can look up North Island Marina or Pierre's. Uh, we can pass these around. This is the North Island Marina is a marina in Port McNeil, uh, and they share space with Pierre's at the show. Both places are excellent, uh, but. I think your reservations, let's pass these around just as, um, as we talk. You have to have reservations in the summer pretty much for any of the food events. That sounds like it's all taken care of. Uh, you can call in and they, they know to expect you. There's good moorage here. If you want a quieter experience, you can moor across the way. Pierre also owns a place called the Cliffside, and you can just take your dinghy back over to the main part of Pierre's. It's a little bit lower key and more relaxed. There's power, water, not potable in my, my view, but you uh, might have a different view. Good fuel there, uh, laundry, showers, cabins for rent if you need them. Really fun place, yeah. So just to clarify where we're at with piers and the pig roast on the 27th, we did reserve, if you've, we reserved as many spots as we could get, but now uh, Tova is asking that we all individually make a mortgage reservation and say you're with this group. So if you haven't and you plan to go, email her for information. I can either get to you or it's in the thread on Tugnuts, but um, sh just tell her you're coming. Her planned arrival date, which is 26th at the latest, that's the Friday before. And um, just to make sure you, you have a spot reserved there for that big roast. Excellent. There's some hiking trails that go over uh, to Billy Proctor's museum. You might have heard about this, or Salmon Coast Station. It's a kind of a research place on, on salmon in the area. Uh, Billy is a hoot. He's, I don't know how old he is now, but it got to be late 80s maybe, uh, 90, something like that. And he's lived at Echo Bay his entire life, and he's kind of eked out an existence doing fishing and logging and salvaging logs that he finds floating in the water. And so this is him in a, a replica logger's cabin. He built the entire thing apparently out of one log. And uh, a neat old guy to talk with and, and share the history. It can be a little gruff seeming at first, but keep talking with him, he'll, he'll warm up to you. His museum is, uh, maybe a generous word, it's a collection of old stuff, but it's, it's cool. Uh, most people really enjoy the visit and, and walking over there. It's, it's a worthwhile part of visiting piers. Generally open from about 9 in the morning and 5 p.m., but loose hours. You can call them on the radio uh, ahead of time. The information's in the Wagner Guide, and uh, make sure that he's, he's available when you want to go over there. Carry bear spray on that trail. There are uh, bears that, that sometimes frequent the area. Another little marina, Quatsi Bay, this one is for sale. Uh, plan is to have it still operating in this coming summer. Piers is also for sale, by the way, if anybody wants a, a retirement project. Uh, but Quatsi Bay is small, very basic, but beautiful location. And Max and Anka are the owners. There's no power. Uh, there is a, a basic building with any washrooms and showers, but this is a pretty rustic facility, but Friendly people, nice location, uh, good stop. Sullivan Bay is a little bit higher end, has a lot of float homes, and some of these will have helicopters in the top or seaplanes moored out front. And it's a good stop with a liquor store. They've got a really big Fourth of July celebration there. That'll probably be a little, you guys will be there a little after that, but if, if you're there earlier, then, then that Fourth of July celebration is fun. They do a restaurant several nights a week, but it, it's varied over the years. I think it's like it's three nights a week, I think, right now. Uh, but double check if you, if you want to go there and, and have a restaurant meal. Reservations recommended here again. Um, and they've got a pretty good store with 
liquor and post office, I think, and um, a, a limited but uh, reasonable selection of, of fresh stuff as well, typically. Shawl Bay is, a, is now, it looks like, closed at least for 2019. So cross that one off the list if it was on your list. There's a little First Nations settlement called New Vancouver, and that can be kind of a cool spot. Most of these marinas are on VHF 66. New Vancouver's on 78. That's the reason I noted it here, but they have uh, moorage and power, and sometimes they'll show you some historic or, or First Nations stuff. Um, so another option when you're up there. Genesis, yeah? So the cash only, would that be, would they take American? Typically, if it's cash only, they'll take American, but they're going to charge you Canadian prices at with American dollars. So, if, yeah, it, you'll lose you know twenty five or thirty percent or whatever on the, which for a night of, a night of mortgage is not that much anyway. So, it, it, it's not the end of the world, but it's uh, I think it's if possible grab some Canadian cash. There there are banks and ATMs um, you know in Campbell River and and Port McNeil and Port Hardy and all that kind of stuff. So Genis Bay is another small marina. The owner actually lives in South Africa uh, and it's kind of year to year. You never know who's going to be there. So it looks like it's going to be open for 2019, but, but I would check ahead of time. No, there, there is good access to logging roads here for stretching your legs and exploring, but not a lot else there. The big caution here is it's up into Drury Inlet and you have to go through Stewart Narrows there can be pretty swift currents in there. And so you want to uh, look at the timing at, at Stewart Narrows. That's going to be a secondary off of, maybe it'll say it in here. I can't remember off the top of my head. Stewart Narrows, the yeah, currents run to about seven knots in there. And it looks like you, slack is about 10 minutes after high or low water at Alert Bay. Uh, so just read that and the, the, it's clear in the Wagner Guide what time would be good. Look at Alert Bay um, at about 10 minutes. You're, you probably could go at high or low at Alert Bay and you'd have no, no trouble at all. And is there any uh, opportunities to ride bikes in any of these places? Uh, good question, is there? And Janus Bay would be one because you can get onto the logging roads. Port McNeil, Port Hardy, to have some options, but mostly it's it's pretty much forest that uh, you might be able to find a logging road somewhere, but bike bike riding would be minimal in in most of these places. A lot of the marinos will have some kind of trail system, but they range from real basic walking paths to some are some are more strenuous, but they tend towards the short and and pretty easy. All right, there are a bunch of anchorages in here. We don't have time to go into all, all the detail about anchorages. The, I would recommend reading the book and talking with, with people who have cruised it extensively and see what their favorites are. There's no shortage of good anchorages and um, kind of anywhere you, anywhere you find that's anchorable is, is likely to be good. Um, it's all pretty much well-protected water and, and nice, pleasant anchorages. So we're going to jump over now to North Vancouver Island, and this is, uh, we're talking over here. So the Broughtons are over here. You have to cross, this is Queen Charlotte Strait, and then you can get into Port McNeil, Swing Tula, Alert Bay, uh, up to Port Hardy, and that area, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and we can chat about uh, the trip planning more specifically with your, your requirements and so forth. This is where you're going to go if you need to resupply, if you have a boat problem, if you have a medical problem, if your dog gets sick and you need to find a vet. Uh, all of the civilization stuff is going to be over in Port McNeil uh, and Port Hardy. So this is a, a relatively short distance you know, from Pierre's over to Port McNeil is uh, somewhere around 30 miles, I think, so an easy day's run. Uh, even, even, you could even go over for the day, pick up supplies, and head back over to the Browns if you wanted. Is the water, um, I mean, you talk a lot about the danger in, say, uh, in John's Strait. Is the water fairly calm in that wide area? 
You, this uh, it can get bumpy here when you get a northwesterly in particular. That typically comes up in the afternoon. And so th th there's a forecast zone called Queen Charlotte Strait, and that's the one that you want to pay attention to. Typically what we see are velocities about half uh, in Queen Charlotte Strait as compared to Johnstone Strait. You can see how narrow Johnstone is, and the, the sides are high in there, and the wind just funnels through and gets accelerated through Johnstone. So Queen Charlotte Strait doesn't tend to be as bad, but it definitely deserves respect. Um, pay attention to the weather there, and if you're hearing gale warnings or something like that, stay up here another day, or somewhere in the Broughtons. So I've touched on Port McNeil a whole bunch tonight, and it's really going to be your go-to resupply point, repair point. Um, there's North Island Marina, and that's the, I passed that brochure around. Super helpful staff. Make reservations there. Uh, it's a private marina. You, they have the fuel dock, but they'll run a uh, fuel hose right out to your boat wherever you're tied up and fill your, your boat up. They can fill up your propane tanks. You just leave them on the dock next to your boat, and they'll run the propane tanks up, fill them, and bring them back to your boat. The big downside for people on smaller boats is there are no showers there uh, at that marina. So if you're looking forward to a hot shower at the marina, um, you're going to need to go over the Harbor Authority next door. These are both behind the same breakwater. Uh, it's, as you come in, the private marina, North Island Marina, is kind of on your right. The Port McNeil Harbor Authority is on your left. Uh, they're both really close to the supermarket which is a good supermarket. You've got a good chandlery. Laundry is right up, up kind of the, uh, a little bit beyond the top of the dock. There are doctors and BC liquor stores. Pretty much everything you might need for uh, after a few weeks in the wilderness is going to be within walking distance in Port McNeil. Are these the loony showers and, and laundry services here? Though? Yeah. So we need, we need a pocket full of loonies. Yeah, and they'll be able to help you with that at uh, at the marina if you, if you arrive and need to switch you know, $20 into loonies or toonies or whatever, whatever their funny money is. So. Yeah? The uh, supermarket laundry uh, says all within the walking distance. Is that like within the blocks or a mile? Uh, less than a mile. I would say, I would say the supermarket's a 10 to 15 minute walk from the, and the laundromat's half that. But <coughs> It de typically depends on the availability of space, and so you should call ahead of time and ask what they're, they can do. The North Island Marina encourages reservations. Port McNeil Harbor Authority does not take reservations. Uh, but there's, there are a lot of boats that are coming in just for a short time, grabbing stuff and heading out. And uh, I think that, that call the marina and ask what, what they want you to do, and it'll become clear. Possible to get uh, some sort of a, a map of the marinas, you know, like a top-down view. Kind yes, of it's in the Wagner guide. Wagner guide? Okay. Yeah, and so if we look, so this is called the, the North Vancouver Island chapter. On page 364, we have uh, a map of Port McNeil, the harbor, North Island Marina, right here, public docks, there. Okay. Uh, it becomes it becomes clear when you head around the breakwater and the North Island Marina folks greet every boat that comes in, grab lines, help out. They're they're really good. The half the walk to the grocery store I think is uh, just up the docks. It's a long way out. So I'm not a big fan of Port Hardy. The, it's not as welcoming to cruisers. The, it's about a mile walk from the the couple of primary marinas into town. There's another dock they put out in the summer that's kind of exposed and is closer to the grocery store. But unless you have a real good reason to go to Port Hardy, don't. <laughs> just, just go to Port McNeil. It's, it's much more welcoming, easier place to get resupplied, uh, and so forth. When you're in Port McNeil, you can also take a ferry out to Sointula. Uh, you can also take your boat to Sointula. And this is a, f it was founded as a utopian cooperative, uh, Finnish fishermen, and it's just got a very laid back, uh, fun vibe. There's nothing really to do, in you know, there's a couple of lousy restaurants and, a, and you can walk through town, but it's, it's somehow charming and uh, we spent a couple of nights there last summer, 
thought we were going to be there for one night, and we ended up just staying for, for two or three just because we were enjoying the relaxed, uh, relaxed pace of life there. There are some free bikes that you can use at uh, the Harbor Master office, and also if you walk into town, you can pick up a bike uh, from the, the tourist office. Alert Bay is a really cool spot. It's a First Nations community, and this is the Umista Cultural Center. There you'll learn all this tragic history of the, uh, the various acts that took away uh, the native regalia, and they, they took away the kids and put them into schools that were kind of Western style and, and broke apart all the families. It's a, a pretty sad history, uh, and it's, it's worth learning about, I think. And you can tie up at the boat harbor in Alert Bay, or you can take the ferry over from Port McNeil. Either one works. Uh, the, there's not a, a lot to do in Alert Bay. There's a small grocery store, but uh, other than the, the Umista Cultural Center, that's, that's kind of the big draw. Uh, really beautiful artwork and masks and copper regalia. And it's, they've been kind of getting this back from all sorts of private collections all over the world. It ended up in Europe and, and parts of Asia and, and the slowly the, the First Nations in Canada have been getting this, this uh, regalia back. Another option in the area, this is it, kind of hard to get in there. It's mainly set up for small fishing boats, but Telegraph Cove, uh, just a little south of Port McNeil, it's a uh, resorty kind of community. Two different marinas. You can read about these in the Wagner Guide and, and get the full story, um, but, but nice options as well. And I think that just about wraps us up, uh, and we'll, we'll then have time to chat a little bit about this, the planning for your trip. But getting home tends to be easier than getting up there. Uh, that's because the winds from the summer are normally from the northwest, so they're behind you coming home. You've already done this whole th trip once, and so you have a little bit of experience behind you. Um, it's, but it's, it can be a little bittersweet on the way home. Your, your trip is coming towards the end, and... Uh, there's a, a lot of temptation for people to just repeat the same steps they took on the way up. I encourage you to see new places on your trip home. Stop at, if you stopped at Blind Channel on the way up, maybe stop at Shoal Bay or, uh, or Stewart Island or some other, other place on your way home. You get to come back through Desolation Sound. You get to enjoy that if you want, or if it's too crowded now that you've been in the Broughtons, you can, can keep hustling through. Um, the rapids turn in the right order. Everything just falls into place much more naturally on the way south.